Management of current assets. There are three important current assets that need to be managed, which is inventory, account receivable, and cash and marketable securities. As for the inventory management, it is important because it involves a lot of capital investment, such as storage costs, insurance costs, pilferage costs, and costs that the inventories may become out of date or obsolete. Pilferage costs here means that reduction in inventory caused by shoplifting or theft. The size of the investment in inventory depends on the type of business the company is in. Most companies would prefer to keep their inventory as low as possible to prevent unwise investment. For example, for a restaurant, they would prefer to keep their inventory as low as possible because they want to maintain the freshness of the food that they produce. But for the factory that produce clothes, maybe they would prefer to keep the inventory higher than a restaurant because uh, maybe their supplier is situated at far away. So the purpose of carrying inventories is to uncouple the operations of the firm that is to make each functions of the business independent of each other functions so that delays or shutdown in one area do not affect productions and sale of the final product. For example, in a factory that produces furniture, there are many departments such as cutting department, assembling department and finishing department. So if one machine in cutting department has breakdown, the furniture would still can be transferred to another department which is assembling department because it does not affect the process so the process will not affect be uh, because the furniture can still be transferred to another department to finish the process as for this process, it will not affect the sale of the final product because the inventories has been transferred to another department without, despite there is a problem in another department. There are three types of inventories, the first one being raw materials, second one being work in progress inventory, and the last one being finished goods. And so about raw materials, raw materials inventory consists of basic materials to purchase from other firms to be used in the firm's production operation. This is to uncouple the production function from the purchasing function um, so that the delay in shipment of raw materials will not cause production delays. And so the second one being work in progress inventory. Work in progress inventory consists of partially finished goods requiring additional work before they can become finished goods. So this is to distinguish the various operations in the production process so that the machine failures and work stoppages in one operation will not affect the other operations. Um, in the work in progress inventory too, the more complex and lengthy the production process is, the larger the investment uh, of the inventory. So for example, at the end of the month, each operation will produce uh, double IP goods, which will be stored separately. This will cause a higher storage cost to the firm, which lead to bigger investment. Another type of inventories is finished goods. Finished goods are goods on which production has been completed but not yet sold. Its purpose is to uncouple the production and sales function so that it's not necessary to produce goods before a sale can occur. In simpler meaning, the sale can be made directly out of inventories. When you don't have sale, you don't have to produce more. And the next slide is about the common techniques of inventory management. There are four basic ways or techniques that are used in, in inventory management, which is the first one, economic order quantity. Economic order quantity is usually uh, one of the ways to, uh, one of the most e efficient ways to minimize the holding costs and also ordering costs. And the second one is ABC system activity-based cost system where they apportion the cost based on the activities and the third one is just in time system where you only acquire the materials or 
any components when you need to produce something. Hello, very good morning and Assalamualaikum to you madam. Uh, I am Fadil Haziq from class KAC 1104C. Okay, the reason why I'm wearing jubah today is sebab saya malas nak pakai baju dan seluar proper lah. Malas sikit. Uh, so, saya pakai jubah lah eh, madam. Alright, so today I'm going to explain about the EOQ. Okay, so there are several types of uh, uh, inventory management. Alright, and EOQ is one of them. So, EOQ, what is actually EOQ? EOQ stands for Economic Ordering Quantity. Which means, uh, uh, it will... It will... Ah, uh, yes. That's <laughs> okay, it will... Uh, Give you the the lowest uh, the lowest cost possible for an inventory uh, for inventory for inventory management to keep an inventory to handle the inventory to order the inventory everything so EOQ will take into account the cost of ordering uh, and the cost of uh, cost of uh, storage storing the the inventory so um, the equation would be uh, the total inventory equals to uh, the ordering cost uh, plus the storing cost. Okay, so EOQ, uh, okay, it will determine the optimal order size. Alright, then uh, okay, uh, how do we get the EOQ, the economic ordering quantity? We can derive it from the formula EOQ is equal to uh, kuasa 2S ordering cost over handling cost, carrying cost. Alright, so uh, I have prepared an example. So let's say we have an annual demand of 48,000 kilogram, ordering cost 30 ringgit, and handling cost of 2 ringgit per unit. Alright, so we can just uh, take all of this and put it into uh, our equation. Lah. So it will equal like this 48,000 times 2. Uh, 48,000 times 2 and then times by ordering cost per order is 30 ringgit over carrying cost which is 2 ringgit so if we put this in calculator we will get the answer of 1200 kilogram okay okay so this is only if we have all the the things given lah so what if we let one of the thing like let's say uh, we don't have the annual demand we only have ordering costs and maybe number of orders so there are one uh, there are another another way to uh, yes to to lah uh, kan? okay so the other way is uh, let's say we have uh, ordering quantity we give uh, several ordering quantity so we we will determine which one will cost us uh, the least lah Okay, so now we have ordering quantity of 1,600, 1,200, 960 and then we have number of orders like we will order it for 30 times uh, this one for ordering quantity of 1,200 we will order it for 40 times and so on lah, macam ni Alright, so we will determine the average stock average stock is ordering quantity divided by 2 because when we order then we will have to uh, we will have this much lah <laughs> once we order again. Alright, so uh, this one average stock is for this one 800, this one 600, this one 480. Alright, then the handling cost is uh, the handling cost times by the units we have, the, the average stock. Sorry, alright, so. This one, 800 times by 2, uh, 1,600. This one, 1,200. This one, 960. Alright, so the ordering cost is the cost per order times by number of order. Alright, so 30 times by 30, we get 900. This one, 1,200. This one is 1,500. Okay, so inventory cost, like I like I to you just now uh, inventory cost is actually the addition of handling cost and ordering cost then only we'll get the inventory cost so this one will cost us 2500 ringgit 
This one 2400 ringgit and this one is uh, 2460. All right. So as a costing manager, we will make sure that we keep the uh, we will make sure we have the uh, highest inventory level possible with the least cost. All right. So which one is the, the lowest one? Is actually the uh, this one. So we will go with the one thousand two hundred ringgit, eh two hundred uh, kilogram lah. Let's say kilogram of apa apa lah kan. Okay, so uh, the the advantage of EOQ is actually we will have the lowest cost of inventory, but also have some disadvantages. Like for example, we have the annual demand uh, is not actually uh, the demand is actually not. Uh, will not be kept at the same level every month or mm, year ke macam tu so uh, that is one of the disadvantages and one uh, and one more is uh, a constant unit price so the 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 price of uh, one thing will vary in 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 times so uh, ordering cost also might increase the handling cost also might increase so we cannot keep that at the same level each time. Okay, so that is the disadvantages of EOQ. And that's all from me, madam. Thank you. Assalamualaikum. My name is Hidayati binti Ilyas Nur. I am from SC1104C. Today, I will present about ABC system. ABC system is a system for inventory control used throughout materials and distribution management. ABC system also used for a wide range of inventory items such as manufacturer products, components, spare parts, finished goods, unfinished goods, or sub-assemblies. Therefore, under this system, a firm's inventory is divided into three categories, which are A, B, and C. A category consists of items with the highest value investment. Usually, it consists of approximately 20% of the firm's inventory items, but about 80% of its in, of its investment in inventory <coughs> the a items are verified daily by running a perpetual inventory system and are closely monitored because of the high because of the high value investment b category consists of the next largest investment in inventory they are monitored on a weekly basis lastly C category consists of a large number of items that require a relatively small investment. They monitor using two bin method. Under this method, each item is stored into two bins. When, it's, when it is needed, it is removed from the first bin. When the first bin is empty, an order is replaced to refill it while inventory is drawn from the second bin the second bin is used until it is empty and the process is repeated that's all from me thank you assalamualaikum and my name is lydia today i will talk and explain about the just in time system or git system just in time system is the materials or components are ordered in such a way that they are arrived just in time when they are needed for production. Dengan kata lain, sistem ni kita akan order barang itu bila kita perlukan je. Dan uh, bila kita nak produce sesuatu barang. And for the next one, just in time only have inventory in WIP. Uh, jadi ini bermaksud kita dapat minimize the storage cost. And in another way, it needs a good cooperation between another firm, especially the supplier.
this just in time system can eliminate non value added activity such as storage inspection and waiting time uh, di mana kita dapat mengurangkan banyak kos di situ in result if we make the manufacturing efficiency saya mengambil contoh di sini uh, mengenai company Toyota di mana mereka menggunakan just in time system ini dalam memproduce sesuatu barang bila mereka mendapat order barang itu ialah kereta mereka mengambil masa 15 tahun untuk menyempurnakan sistem tersebut. Namun begitu, pada 1967, supplier kepada syarikat Toyota, Toyota tersebut mengalami kebakaran yang besar di mana mereka menghilang supplier untuk mendapat spare part-spare part kereta tersebut. Uh, oleh oleh itu, uh, disebabkan kejadian itu, mereka ke kerugian 160 bilion yen pada tahun tersebut. Jadi, sistem ini juga mempunyai buruknya, kelemahannya juga. Namun begitu, setiap sistem mempunyai baik buruknya. Okey, sekian saja pada saya. Sekian. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. My name is Muhammad Aiman bin Muhammad Azri. I'm from KAC 1104C. So today I want to explain about MRP material material requirement planning. MRP is a system for calculating the material and component needed to manufacture a product. MRP was initially created to determine the types of material order and when to order them. For an example, the factory that produced the bicycle wanted to order 100 unit of brake and the factory wanted within 2 weeks of the good arriving at the factory. A simulation is carried out to determine each product's bill of material, inventory status and manufacturing process. So the factory, for an, for an example, the factory, uh, want, the factory wanted to know the price of 100 unit of brake. Uh, so 100 unit of brake words RM250 ringgit the inventory status refer to the cost uh, to keep the 100 unit of brake in the inventory uh, so the cost uh, words RM80 ringgit and the manufacturing process the cost to manufacturing process the cost to manufacturing process RM100 then the objective of this system is to lower the firm's inventory investment without unduly affecting the production so MRP we can conclude that this system refer to the way to to uh, decrease or to the to lower the inventory investment without without do the production thank you okay and talk about account receivable management account receivable is an account where we will use when we make a sale on credit for example uh, Ali want to buy my product so Ali is my account receivable he buy my product but he didn't pay yet he will pay it later so Ali will be uh, my account receivable uh, so, so account receivable ni dia yang sebenarnya ni penghutang bila kita jual barang ke orang secara kredit so orang beli barang kat kita secara kredit okay. macam orang tu dia beli produk kita so nanti dia tak bayar lagi tapi dia dapat barang tu dia akan bayar kemudian ok lepas tu account receivable ni uh, almost 25% dalam kira uh, firma ni punya asset lah so account receivable uh, must be closely monitored because the cash flow from a sale cannot be invest until the account is collected kira cash flow dia tak boleh nak invest lah sebab tak dapat kutip lagi ha, kira ada kat hutang ni so i will be explaining about um, size of investment in account receivable so dalam ni ada tiga benda penting iaitu percentage of credit sales to total sales 
level of sales and credit collection policies so ini tiga benda ni ok ni yang ni ok so saya explain yang nombor satu tu dulu percentage of credit sales to total sales so percentage of credit sales to total sales ni ok kita tahu dalam total sales tu it is a combination of credit sales and cash sales combined together kan so it becomes total sales so macam mana kita nak determine whether the size of investment in account receivable to big or small kita tengok dia punya percentage ni lah ok so let's say lah kita ada total sales uh, of uh, 100 lah kan total sales kita 100 so let's say kita punya credit sales pula 60 ok so the rest cash sales berapa 40 ya kan 40 So, 40 cash sales Ok, so daripada sini kita dah boleh determine tau Kita kena kita kena divide lah Dia punya 60% credit sales tu Divide by 100 Kita dapat 60, 60% kan So, 60% tu is actually um, The size of investment in a receivable tu Is actually big lah Sebab it's more than half More than 50% So kat situ Dia punya ratio dia pun Credit sales ada 60 Cash sales ada 40 So the size of investment in Account receivable tu Big lah So kalau If let's say Dia punya credit sales 40 So jadi 40% lah Dia punya Percentage of credit sales So kat situ dia punya Size of investment in Account receivable tu uh, Kecil lah nah, It is uh, Macam tu lah uh. So we move on to the second point Level of sales Level of sales The more sales we make The greater the accounts receivables Ni logic dia simple je Very simple Lagi banyak sales yang kita buat Lagi banyak account receivable Maksudnya macam Okay lagi banyak credit sales yang kita buat Lagi banyak penghutang yang akan berhutang dekat kita So lagi banyak penghutang yang akan berhutang dekat kita Lagi banyak duit yang kita dapat collect daripada orang. Haa uh. So, ya, yeah, logik dia macam tu je ha, Senang lah kan So, kita move on to the The third point lah Alright, bye We move on to credit and collection policies Okay, so as for credit and collection policies Dia kata a set of decision That include a firm's credit period Credit standards Collection procedures And discount offer So, dalam dalam point ni dia ada banyak tau sub, sub sub point dia So benda tu credit period Credit standards Collection procedures And discount offered So as Okay Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh My name is Muhammad Fikri So I want to explain to you about the Determinants of investment in account receivable apa yang kita faham dengan investment in account receivable which is the pelaburan dalam account receivable tu sendiri maksud kat sini uh, account receivable ni dia adalah satu account di mana tiada uh, aliran duit masuk maksud dia kat sini kalau macam mungkin kita ada dua dua sale cash sale dengan credit sale kan so, kalau cash sale tu tak ada masalah kita dapat cash on the spot tapi yang jadi masalah kat sini adalah the credit sale so we have to look at the percentage of credit sale to the total sales iaitu ada dua iaitu cash sale dengan credit sale tu so kita nak determine first tu kita nak determine dia punya percentage of credit sale dulu sebab kita nak make care dia punya investment dia tu ok so kita kena kira lah berapa percentage dia untuk dapatkan dia punya credit sale tu and then kita juga kena tengok uh, company tu kena tengok macam level of sales dia berapa kalau macam level of sale tu tinggi maknanya dia account sale tu kita tu lagi tinggi lah it depends on the, the level of credit sales also so next is the credit and collection policies dia ada kat sini dia bagi tiga iaitu credit standards uh, 
credit and clash credit standard credit period and collection policy okey collection policy kat sini dia cakap macam uh, untuk kita tengok berapa lama dia boleh bayar kat situ macam length of time before credit sale are collected policy adakah dia layak untuk adakah company tu layak untuk dapatkan credit sale ataupun tidak contoh macam selalunya uh, bisnes yang besar-besar yang akan guna credit sale ni sebab bisnes yang kecil-kecil ni just guna cash sale sahaja that's why kita kena tengok dia punya percentage dia and dia punya kelayakan lah kalau layak kita akan bagi ok so kita kena dalam ni juga kita teng kena tengok dia punya risiko sometimes ada yang customer tu dia bayar lewat kita tengok, kena tengok lah yang tu yang tu kita kena tangguh sendiri sebab tu nama dia investment of economics in income receivable pelaburan kita dulu duit kita dulu yang keluar untuk tanggung kos yang lain sebelum dapat contoh macam kan kita ada 30 bulan of credit sales tu kan 30 bulan eh 30 hari in one 30 hari ataupun sebulan credit term tu kan uh, so kita tak consider dia boleh bayar dalam masa yang ke masa sebulan tu so kita teng kena, teng kena tanggung jugalah risiko tu that's mean by investment in accountables Bismillahirrahmanirrahim Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh My name is Muhammad Hazman I'm from class KAC 1104C Today I will discuss about term of sale So basically term of sale is a credit terms That are laid out by a firm For credit to be extended to the customers Term of sale can be identified for the possible discount for early payment the discount period and the total credit period. Therefore, they are stated in this form. A slash B net C. A stands for the possible discount for early payment while B stands for the discount period and net C is for the total credit period. As you can see, if the customer managed to pay within the discount period B, Therefore, the customer uh, may receive the discount. If the customer fails to pay within the discount period, the customer must make the payment within the total net pe total credit period, and the customer will not receive the discount. As an example, the trade credit terms of two percent for within ten days net thirty. This indicates that the customer will receive two percent discount if the customer manage to pay within 10 days but if the customer fail to pay within 10 days the customer must pay within 30 days and will not receive the 2% discount if the customer fail to pay within the 10 days and fail to get the discount it will come the, it will become a cost to the customer the cost will be represented by the formula Annualized opportunity cost of foregoing the discount equals to A divided by 1 minus A times 360 divided by C minus B. This formula is to determine the cost that the customer would get. Therefore, uh, as example, if the credit terms is 2% within 10 days, net 30, uh, 2% A will represent the possible discount for early payment that is 2% so A divided by 1 minus A is 0 0.02 divided by 1 minus 0 0.02 times 360 divided by C that is uh, the total credit period uh, 30 minus B B is the total discount period that is 10 equals to 36.73% so this is the cost for the customer
if he fails to pay within the total discount period and fail to get the discount. So that. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. So, saya akan explain pasal process of credit selection tak for customer. So process of credit selection ni uh, quite important uh, to manage our current asset. Okay, the first one is to determine who is to qualify for the trade credit. Maksudnya untuk kita tentukan sama ada customer tu qualify ke tak untuk kita jual dia kat dia on credit. Okay, second one is default cost vary directly with the quality of customers. As the customer's credit ratings declines, the chance that the account will not be paid on time increases. Maksudnya, uh, apabila credit rating customer tu rendah ataupun merusut, chances uh, untuk customer tu tak bayar adalah tinggi. So, uh, apabila customer tak dapat nak bayar on time, uh, kita punya default cost akan increases juga increases jugalah ok and the third one is collection cost also increase as the quality of the customer declines the decline in customer quality result in the in increased cost of credit investigation collection and default ok collection cost uh, juga akan meningkat apabila quality of customer tu rendah sebab bila customer tak dapat bayar uh, kita akan guna banyak cost dekat collection ni untuk yang perlu kita spend untuk kita kutip balik daripada customer tu so banyaklah cost collection yang kita kena keluarkan sebab tu dia kata collection cost also increases ok uh, yang keempat In determining whether or not to grant credit to an individual customer, the firm is primar- primarily interested in the customer's short-run ability and inclination to pay. Thus, uh, liquidity ratios, other obligations and overall profitability of the customer become the focal point. One way in which uh, both individuals and firms are often evaluated as credit risk is through the use of credit scoring and the 5C C system. Uh, nombor empat ni maksudnya untuk tentukan sama ada uh, kita nak benarkan dekat individu tu uh, macam ni eh. Sama ada kita nak benarkan kita jual dekat individu sama ada individu itu layak untuk kita bagi kredit adalah kita tengok dulu dekat customer tu punya short run ability dengan dia punya kebolehan untuk bayar so uh, liquidity ratios and other obligations and overall profitability customer ni be- jadi dia punya focal point lah untuk kita tentukan sama ada dia ni layak ataupun tidak uh, untuk dijual atas kredit So, satu cara untuk kita evaluate individu dengan firm untuk yang layak ni dengan menggunakan credit scoring ataupun 5C system. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, continuing on, I will present the first technique of credit selection uh, which is the 5C system. Uh, so, the first C is character uh, which refers to the probability that the customer will try to honor their obligations. Uh, meaning that uh, most creditors will try to evaluate their customers uh, based on their credit reputation. Uh, okay, so the second C is capacity, uh, which is the ability for the customers to pay the creditors back their credits. Uh, the third C is capital, uh, which is measured by the general financial condition of the firm as indicated by an analysis of its financial statement. Uh, so... Uh, the creditors will most likely uh, give credit to a customer that has a huge amount of capital. Uh, the fourth C is collateral, uh, which is represented by an asset that the customer offers as security in order to obtain the credit. Uh, so, the customer will uh, usually offer uh, a vehicle or a furniture in order to obtain the credit from the creditors. Uh, 
uh, the fifth C is condition, uh, which refers to the general economic trends and the special development in certain geographic regions or sectors of economy that may affect customers' ability to meet their obligations. Uh, so basically, uh, creditors will look at the overall uh, page and uh, try to look at the sectors of economy or geographic regions and also the purpose of the loan itself. Next is second technique of credit selection, credit scoring. As the first statement, the credit scoring is a number range between 300 to 850 that illustrate the consumer credit worthiness. The higher the credit score, the more attractive the borrower. Uh, the derived weight in the statement in this picture means the the range between 300 and 850. So they got factor that used to calculate the credit scoring that is repayment history, type of loan, length of credit history and individual total debt so the purpose of credit scoring is to make an informed credit decision quickly and cheaply so as conclusion the higher the credit scoring the more attractive the borrower and semakin banyak kepercayaan mereka kepada pelanggan mereka Assalamualaikum My name is Zulaika So today I'm going to share about credit monitoring So basically credit monitoring is an ongoing review of a firm's account re receivable to determine whether customers are paying according to the stated credit terms In simple words credit monitoring is the process of reviewing your credit reports for accuracy and changes that could be indicative of false, fraudulent or suspicious activity or changes. So, the key to maintain control over the collection of accounts receivable is the fact that the probability of default increase with the age of the account. So, this means that the higher the age of the account or the longer the duration of the existence of the account, the higher the default or the fraudulent increase. This means that if you if your account have the longer duration, so the probability to default occur is higher. And that's why control of account receivable focuses on the control and eliminated of past due receivable. So basically, past due can be stated as outstanding or overdue. So this means that if your account have been outstanding or overdue or past due, then your account will be eliminated. So that's all from me. Thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. My name is Nur Azhar Zaminti Rosni. I will be continuing the slide. Uh, credit monitoring and collection policy. Uh, ni ada lima teknik which is the average collection period, aging of account receivable, ratio of receivables to asset, account receivable turnover ratio and lastly the ratio of bad debts to credit sale. Okay, first, the average collection period ni um, the is the average number of day between the date credit sale were made and the uh, date money was received from the customer. Ni dah cek kiri nak kira sales in account receivable. Ah, uh, dia kalau ada uh, an increase in the average collection period may be result of a predetermined plan to extend credit terms. Biasa kalau lagi tinggi average collecting period lagi tinggi lagi tinggi um apa the predetermined plan to extend credit sale maksudnya ah uh, lagi tinggi account receivable collection period tu lagi tinggi pertimbangan macam ni kalau lagi panjang periodnya lagi uh, lagi panjang lah untuk extend the credit sale okay, the second one the aging of account receivable ni the report the list of uh, unpaid customer invoice and also the unused credit memos this aging of account receivable menunjukkan the total of account receivable balance yang outstanding this is this purpose 
to allow the firm to discover their problems. The third one, the ratio of receivable to assets, uh, to reveal the safe receivable, the size receivable in current asset and the opportunity cost associated with it. Yang lagi um, lagi menunjukkan yang lagi tinggi percentage, lagi tinggi cost carrying the receivable. And also, and uh, firm uh, need to carry the least percentage of receivable as possible without uh, effect the sale volume. Lagi nombor empat, account receivable turnover ratio. This account to measure the company's effectiveness in collect, collecting uh, in collection uh, receivables. Dia nak tunjuk berapa, macam mana efektifnya dia orang uh, ki, nak kira dan collect dia uh, punya receivable. Dia berapa kali dia akan kira untuk berapa kali dalam setahun dia akan collect um, average dia akan receivable. Uh, lastly, the ratio of bad debts to credit sale uh, and increasing ratio may indicate to many weak account or an aggressive market expansion policy. Dia lagi tinggi ratio tu, uh, lagi tinggi ratio of bad debts tu akan okay, lagi uh, indicate to the weak account, aggressive account market expansion policy which is this, uh, which is seek to encourage economic growth in form of monetary policy or physical policy. Uh, I think that's all for me. Thank you very much. Okay, collection techniques. The first collection techniques is letters. After a certain number of days, the firm sends a polite letter reminding the customer of the overdue account. If the account is not paid within a certain period after this letter has been sent, a second more demanding letter is sent. The second one is telephone calls. If letters prove unsuccessful, a telephone call may be made to request immediate payment. If the customer has a reasonable excuse, arrangement may be made to extend the payment period. Management of cash. Cash is the currency and coin that the firm has in hand in their petty cash, cash register, cash drawers, and so on. Basically, cash is the money that you or the company or any shop has in hand. It also called as non-earning assets. Non-earning assets is an asset that does not deliver any returns. It does not generate any income nor gain value over time. For example, petty cash of a business, real estate, and also car. Car is an asset, but it does not gain value over time and does not generate any income unless it is used to offer services to others such as grab services. Then it does not call as non-earning assets. Management of cash Cash manager is someone in a business that controls the collection and usage of the business's cash. For example, like finance manager. The goal for a cash manager is to minimize the amount of cash the firm must hold for use in conducting its normal business activities and at the same time to have sufficient cash. There are four main reasons why a business needs to sufficient cash at hand at all time. First, to take discount for early payments. This is to offer discounts to the debtors to accelerate cash into the company. Second, to maintain its credit rating by keeping its current and asset the test ratios in line with those other firms in the industry. Asset test ratio here means comparing a company's current assets to its current liabilities to see if a company has enough cash to pay its immediate liabilities, such as short-term debt. It disregards inventory due to the difficulty of the inventory to liquidate quickly. Hence, it helps in maintaining the liquidity of a firm which resulting lower risk in insolvency. Insolvency only happens to a firm when they are unable to meet its maturing liabilities on time. Whereas, credit rating is the evaluation of the credit risk of a prospective debtor predicting their ability to pay back their debt. In short, it means that the cash manager would evaluate the debtors in their potential on paying the debt as well as calculating and comparing their cash and cash equivalent and their debt to keep up in the industry. Third, to meet unexpected need for cash, such as strikes made by the employees or citizen, basically the damage of a strike. Besides that, extra marketing campaign or even weather 
seasonal and cyclical downturn. Like for example, to cover the loss and damage of a company after the bad typhoon landed in the area. Lastly, to take advantage of a favorable business opportunity such as a special offers from suppliers or the chance to branching out the business or even acquire another firm. The firm help to cover day-to-day transaction. The amount of the cash that a firm have are based on their need in their industry. As example, utilities firms have less transaction balance compared to computer software firms. Next is precautionary balance. Precautionary balance means cash reserve that a firm keep for an unforeseen emergency or an unexpected outflow. Precautionary balance are a buffer stock of liquid asset. So the less predictable the firm's cash flow, the larger such balance should be. But it is vice versa if the firm has easy access to borrow funds. As example, airline industry hold a larger precautionary balance because of the high degree of cash flow uncertainty. So welcome to Madam and Friends. So there are four motives for holding cash and I will explain whether are the two motives which are speculative balance and compensating balance. Speculative balance here means a cash balance that is held to enable the firm to take advantage on, of any bargain purchases that might arise. Bargain purchase here means that purchase at a lower value than its fair market value. So for the for the explanation, you can see here. So the example for speculative balance is, for example, construction companies will have a large speculative balance in anticipation of a significant drop in number cost. Number here means ah uh, number is a wood that used as a material for to construct a building so lumber cost mean a building material cost so here means that construction companies will uh, have a cash balance uh, which are speculative balance uh, and wait until the cost of material or lumber cost significant drop and after that they will make a bargain purchase the other example for us to more understand is if the firm feels the price of a raw material are likely to fall in the future, it will help, uh, it will hold cash and wait, uh, wait till the price actually fall. So this is for for the explanation, for the example of speculative balance. So the other one is compensating balance. So compensating balance means a checking account balance that a firm must maintain with a bank to compensate the bank for services in the rate or for granting a loan. In other words, compensating balance mean uh, is a minimum minimum bank account balance that must be maintained and it agreed between firm and the bank. For example, uh, the minimum balance that must be maintained in a firm's bank account at least uh, 200,000 ringgit for example. The other example is, uh, for example, the firm or company wants to granting for a loan. So, compensating balance is used to offset the cost incurred by a bank to set up a loan. It means that compensating balance is used by a bank to offset the cost incurred for them to set up a loan for the company. Uh, it because it's for the bank to mitigate its risk exposure to company. So for for the explanation, you can see here. So that's all for me. Thank Assalamualaikum. You. In the management of current asset, I will present slide 30 which is risk return trade off. The financial manager must strike an acceptable balance between holding too much cash and too little cash. A larger cash investment minimizes the change of insolvency but penalizes company profitability which is uh, if they hold a larger of cash, uh, they can able to pay the loan uh, or the money have their own. 
For example, the less inventory a firm keeps, the higher the expected return, uh, since less of the firm current asset is tied up. But there is also a greater risk of running out of cash and stock and thus losing potential revenue. A small cash investment frees excess balance for investment in both marketable securities and longer life Assets. This enhanced company for profitability and the value of the firm's common share, but increase the chance of running out of cash. So that means the higher risk that the company take in the cash investment, there will be greater the risk that the company must be be taken in between, uh, in the investment. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and my name is Nur Shafika. I'm going to explain about cash planning. Cash planning, cash planning also known as cash budget. Cash budget is a statement of the cash inflows and outflows from the operations that has been planned by the firms. It also known as an estimate of the firm's short-term cash requirement where it estimate how many how much cash that the firm needs in a set, in a short term of period and it's also it's normally covered for one not more than one year which is further divided into smaller time intervals for example quarters and semi annually lastly it's also <coughs> indicates whether there is a cash shortage or surplus will be expected in the time interval covered by the forecast that's all, thank you. Assalamualaikum, my name is Nurul Hazika Binti Zukafli from class KSC 1104C. Management of receipt and payment. The receipt, processing and collecting time for the firm both from its customer and to its supplier is the focus of receipt and disbursement management. Float refers to the payment that have been paid for by the payer and not yet usable for the payee. It is important in the CCC because it presents lengthens both the firm's SCP and PDP. The payment paid by the payer have to go through three stages and that is why it can lengthen the SCP and the PDP because the payee cannot use the money when he receives the payment. Uh, next, the float has three components, which is mail float, processing float, and clearing float. Mail float is the length of time between mailing of the payment and its receipt. This, is, this means when the payer made the payment and before he received the receipt ok next processing float processing float is the length of time between receipt of payment and its deposit into the firm's account so this simply means when the time the payer received uh, the receipt the receipt of payment and when the money deposit into the firm's account and the next one is clearing float clearing float is the length of the time between deposit of the payment and when the payment is able to use for the firm this means that when the money already deposit into the firm's account and when the firm can use the payment for the production that's all thank you hello assalamualaikum everyone now i am going to explain about techniques in managing the float um before that i'm sure you all who watched this video already aware on what is float is all about based on previous previous videos before me so i'll continue with managing the float okay basically there are three techniques in managing the float which is the first one is speeding up collection the second one is slowing down payment and third one is cash concentration okay speeding up collection um basically state state here that um reduce customers collection float time and reduce the firm's account payable which also reduce the investment that firm must make in its 
um, cash conversion cycle. Okay, basically, uh, speeding up collection um, is a strategy to make the customers make payment as soon as possible. Because we, as a firm, we want them to make payment as as we did a business. So yes, that's why. Okay. Speeding up collection uh, can be accomplished by using a lockbox system. Okay, what is actually a lockbox system? It is a service provided by bank to us companies for the receipts of payment made by our customers. Okay, under this service, payment made by customers are directed to a special post office box instead of going to the company itself. Okay, and then bank will collect and process this payment directly and deposit them to company's account okay on top of that bank will also earn fixed monthly fee for each lock box place as well as their servicing charge lah. okay for your information um lock box will be placed strategically near geographic clusters of companies customers so that their aggregate mail time from customers to lockbox can be minimized that's why they will be placed lah based on where their cus their uh, our company's customers uh, locate okay okay for your information lockbox is an efficient way of deposit Depository customers' payment, especially when company is unable to deposit check on a timely basis. Okay, if it's constantly receiving customers' payment through mail, lock box can also be very risky. Where if the bank employees, let's say, who are accessible to the lock box, okay, when he is rarely supervised, so it may lead to a fraud. But yes. That's basically about what is lockbox is all about. Okay, let's move on to the slowing down a payment. Okay, um, the second one is slowing the payment by using control dispersing. Okay, which involves the strategic use of mailing points and bank account lentil mail flow and clearing flow lah. Okay, if you don't know what is mail flow, it's like a time delay. Yeah, time delay like that. Okay, basically, we as a business, we have to slow in down our payments so that we can manage our flow well. Um, okay, control disbursement. What is actually a disbursement? It is like um, a payment, okay? It will enable company to review disbursement. Okay, we can review our disbursement. We can review uh, expenditure on a daily basis, you know. In turn, it enables the company, which is us, to maximize our cash flow for investment and debt payment. Uh, you know, when we can review it for daily, so we have choice what to do with our money, how to manage our money. So basically, that's control disbursement. You know, we can um, check where the payments go and something like that okay with this service company can keep their funds invested in account that earn higher interest payment okay then company can earn that interest from this service by keeping their funds invested between float times okay if you don't know what float times is uh is this a mail float and clearing float uh, it is a time delay okay you can refer to a previous video that explained about this right that is basically a control displacement and then the third one is cash concentration uh, it is a process used to bring locks box and other deposit together into one bank. Okay? The transfer of cash to concentration bank can be achieved through the following mechanism. Okay, we have uh, four mechanisms. The first one is depository transfer check, automated clearing house transfer, wire transfer, and zero balance account. Okay. Cash concentration when the, it is a man management strategy that in, that involves the transfer of all funds from different account to a single centralized account. Okay, it will increase cash management lah. Uh, you know, uh, cash management efficiency when we put all together uh, like that. 
Okay, the first mechanism that can be achieved is tapestry transfer check state here that it is an unsigned check drawn on one of firm's bank account and deposit in into another. Okay, okay. Once the DTC clear, then the transfer is complete. Um, so basically, DTC uh, used by companies to collect revenue from multiple location, which are then deposit into one lump sum at a bank uh, like that so yes uh, another person will continue the slides the other slides and i've done my part thank you so much for listening and yes hope you will understand with my explanation thank you the transfer of cash to construction bank can be achieved through the following mechanism which is a uh, DTC, ACH, Y transfer, and zero balance account. I will explain on ACH, Y transfer, and zero balance account. For ACH, it's a pre authorized electronic withdrawal from the payer's account and deposit into the payee's account via a settlement among bank by the automatic clearing house. It moves fund from one bank to another, and the process of payment will be done automatically. Not manually. Uh, and the ACH transfer could be clear in only one day compared to DTC, which may take several days. For example, the employer direct deposit uh, the wages to the employee account. Next is a wire transfer. An electronic communication that via bookkeeping entries remove funds from the payer's bank and deposit them in the payee's bank. It transfer of fund from one bank to another electronically. There's no physical money is transferred between bank when conducting the wire transfer. It's a fast way to get the money and it's a as the wire transfer are more expensive, more expensive than DTC and ACH transfer. Next is a zero balance account, which is disbursement account that always have an end of day balance of zero. So whenever funds are required to cover a uh, any transaction, they, they are transferred from the master account in the exact amount required. That's why there will be zero balance. Next is the advantage of using cash concentration. First is it create a large pool of funds for use in making short term investment, uh, which means the pool cash could be maximized for investment opportunities and then it improves tracking and internal control of the firm cash so the firm cash uh, could be controlled efficiently and could be tracked next is it allows the firm to implement payment strategies that reduce the either cash balance Hi, Assalamualaikum. My name is Siti Kamalia and today I will be discussing regarding marketable securities. So what are marketable securities? It's actually assets that can be liquidated into cash quickly. Or it can, it can also be defined as securities that can be sold off in short notice, usually within a year. It, it is also called as near cash assets and these are the security investments of the firm that the firm can use to um, quickly convert into cash balances when they are in need of working capital. Um, and these highly liquid securities, they can only be issued either by the government or strong and big corporations. Not everyone can simply issue uh, marketable securities. So as mentioned earlier, these securities, they tend to mature in a year or less so it could either be um, 
equity securities such as stocks or debt securities such as bonds. A um, few examples of types of Malaysian marketable securities that are commonly used here are MTB, Malaysian Treasury Bills. We also have promissory notes, bill of exchange. The most common type of bill of exchange is checks. And we also have certificate of deposit or CD. CD is somehow similar to the normal account saving but it also has strict differences. It is similar in terms of it is insured and it is virtually risk free. But however, it is different because um, CD, it has fixed term and fixed interest rate. And CD is to be held until the maturity by which the time the money may be withdrawn together with the accrued um, interest. So, um, one way, one example scenario that can explain how actually marketable securities work is okay. Let's say uh, you have an entity like a company, a big company. It needs capital, so this company it issues or it releases a security that investors can buy. Um, the security may be like uh, stocks. If they issue stocks, it might give the investors ownership in the entity. Um, if maybe it uh, it releases bonds, uh, which will give the rights to the investors to receive back the capital plus interest later on. Uh, so these investors they have bought these securities, right? So they can either keep their securities or they can either sell it at the open market. Um, so it can be seen here that securities can um, represent an option for issuers who wants to raise their capital and in certain cir circumstances it may be better than taking up a loan uh, and taking up a bank loan um, whereas for investors it can uh, be a, a potentially good money making opportunity so to sum up about marketable securities it is actually it is basically assets that can be quickly converted to cash and firms usually invest in these marketable securities for precautionary and speculative mo motives and as temporary investments to uh, to back them up during off peak seasons that's all thank you assalamualaikum and hi my name is Tina Hidayah so we will continue to slide number 39, uh, rational for holding marketable securities. So they are divided into two, which are as a substitute for cash and as a temporary investment. So they serve as a substitute for cash balances. These securities are held up primarily for precautionary purposes to guard against a possible shortage of bank credit. So some firms, they hold marketable securities because um they can be easily converted into cash so when the company's cash outflows exceed cash inflows so at any point in time they can sell their marketable securities to obtain cash um so uh this can be applied when uh they face a shortage of bank credit Okay, so let's move to second question now. They are used as temporary investment. Temporary investment in marketable securities occur in one of the following two situations. The first situation is to finance seasonal or cyclical operations. If the firm has a conservative financing policy, then its long-term capital will exceed its permanent assets and marketable securities will be held when inventories and receivables are low. So, I will give you an example. Um, the company sells a winter jacket. So, during winter season, they will get high demand. And let's say, um, to, uh, and let's say, they are running low on fabric to make a winter jacket so they use the marketable securities to purchase the fabric to meet the high demand
So this is when a company use a conservative approach. But when uh, a company use aggressive approach, it will hardly to carry uh, the marketable securities. But uh, they will borrow heavily on a short term basis to meet sales demand at peak levels. The second situation is to meet non-financial requirement such as tax payment and maturing bond issue. So, for example, the company has to pay for tax on 50 August amounted to 100,000 ringgit. But they only have 50,000 ringgit. So, they liquidate the marketable securities to uh, top up another 50,000 ringgit. Okay, like that. Understand? So, that's all from me. Thank you. Uh, there are a few factors influencing the choice of marketable securities. <clears throat> First of all, uh, default risk. The risk that a borrower will not pay the interest or principal on a loan. Contohnya, Ali ada hutang 900. Tapi, disebabkan interest, dia kena bayar 1000 sebulan. Tapi, sebab dia tak cukup duit so bulan tu dia tak dapat nak bayar hutang dengan bank tu so maksudnya bank kena tanggung um, hutang yang dia hutang oleh Ali uh, ok next uh, interest rate risk the risk of declines in bond prices to which inv- investors are exposed due to rising interest rate so bila interest rate ni naik harga barang tu akan turun so, bila harga barang tu turun, hmm, company tu yang kena tanggung kos barang tu. So, third one, the uh, inflation risk. The risk that inflation will reduce the purchasing power of a given sum of money. Hmm. Bila, contoh, ok, kita ada 100, kita ada 100 ringgit. Um, patutnya kita boleh beli satu troli penuh dengan barang dapur tapi disebabkan inflasi inflation um, 100 ringgit tu kita boleh dapat separuh troli je yang kita beli dekat dekat apa dekat market ok um, next marketable risk uh, the risk that securities cannot be sold at close to the quoted market price. Uh, the ri- um, which is the risk that an individual or firm will have difficulty selling an asset without inc- incurring a loss. The risk there may be a lack of interest in the market for a particular asset, forcing the owner to sell it for less than its actual value. And last but not least, uh, yields, uh, return on securities. Uh, in finance, the yield on a security is the amount of cash, which is in percent- percentage terms that returns to the owner of the security in the form of interest or dividends received from it.